I'm Dave Casper. Welcome to another edition of Inclusive Magazine. Our guest today is one of the few people in implant dentistry that literally needs no introduction. Please welcome Dr. Carl Misch. Carl, thanks for being here today. Hello, Dave. Good to see you again. Good to see you, my friend. Yeah. So we're here in Las Vegas, the AAID annual conference. You gave an outstanding lecture yesterday on immediate implant placement. Uh, probably a thousand people in the room, standing ovation, and a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes. I yes. can't imagine that's your first one, but uh, it was nice to see you up there. It was nice to, to receive the award and, of course, the invitation to be here and share my experiences with the group at large. It's a great, uh, it's a great meeting so far. Uh, but I want to start really from the beginning uh, and go all the way back, and that is the decision to go to dental school. You graduated University of Detroit in right. 1973. So what made you decide to go to dental school? And I can't imagine there was any implant exposure in that program back then. Well, actually there was. Um, let's start with why I went to University of Detroit. Um, it's because I lived in Detroit. <laughs> and it's good enough reason. I was the first one in my family that went to college um, so that my dad was a bricklayer. And um, I can remember when I was about five years old playing outside to kick the can. All the kids used to play and an ice cream truck would come down the road and, and um, we'd all run and get some money for an ice cream. And I went in running to my dad and he was working at, it at his desk looking at some blueprints, bidding on a j job, because he owned a construction company, and, and like I said, he's a bricklayer. So I said, Dad, can I have some money for an ice cream? And he said, no. And I remember being shocked at that. And I stopped, and I looked at him, and I said, what job do I need that I never have to ask you for money again? Wow. And he looked at me kind of shocked, and he said, um, a dentist or an attorney? I had no idea what an attorney was. <laughs> I had some teeth taken out. I knew what a dentist was. <laughs> so I said, I'm going to be a dentist. And, of course, when you're growing up, everybody always asks young kids growing up, what are you going to be when you grow up? Right. You know, they expect to say a fireman or whatever. Right. And I said, I'm a dentist. And after saying that for, like, 10 years, <laughs> I said, why not, you know? And... Then I was lucky enough to get sports scholarships into college because my family couldn't afford it. I got married when I was only 18, um, and so I had to provide for a wife and a kid, and I didn't have any money to go to college. But I was, I was good in sports. I played football and baseball and diving and wrestling, and I ended up getting a baseball scholarship to University of Detroit. Wow. Um, and so I played baseball for them, was captain of the team for a couple of years, uh, set quite a few hitting records. Um, so then I got invited to spring training um, by the same scout that drafted L. Kaline, who was the hero in our town at that time. And at spring training, I found out that once you get into the minor league system, only 5% ever make it to the pros even one day. Wow. I thought once you were in minor leagues, you were so just automatic. the next step. And when I heard one out of 20 go on from here, I'm married, I have a kid, and I had gotten accepted to dental school. And so I said, well, if I go to dental school, I'm going to be, make a living, you know. But so that's why I chose dentistry. And because I had a wife and kid and a captain of a team and college team in baseball. The other students in that freshman dental class um, elected me president of their class. And we had a Because you seemed team. responsible, I'm sure, I, by comparison. Yeah, well, I, yeah. I had to be responsible. <laughs> you, know, you got a little, little kid and a wife. <laughs> and, um, and because of the sports scholarship, that added a little bit of you know, flavor to the mix, I guess. Yeah. And we had a brand new dean. And I took the role on as president of the class like a union leader. So if we had more than one test in one day, I'd go to the teachers to negotiate, to, to spread it out, you know. <laughs> if we had any notes from the previous class, I would copy them, make sure everybody in the class had it. Um, at the end of the year, we'd look at the points, the clinic points people have, and if a few of us had many more clinic points than others, we'd share them so that we'd get through as a class. And so Great. as a consequence of that, 
commitment of sharing and that we're t doing this as a team, not as individuals. Instead of competing with each other, we started supporting each other and they ended up electing me every year president. And then I became president of student body and, and we had this new dean come in and because I was this union leader, I um, found out that he had a PhD in um, histology and anatomy. He was a periodontist and I went to the library and pulled out any publications he had and he had published a couple papers with a guy named Bodine who was one of the original people from Loma Linda that did subperiosteal implants and Clyde Mohammed did the histology mm -hmm. on these subperiosteal implants, human histology, first time it was ever reported. And so I read his papers and when I met the dean, of course he says, why'd you become a dentist? I said, well, I became a dentist to learn about implants. He says, oh, I've written some papers and I, oh, you did, oh yeah, well. He says, well, let me restructure your education so that when you take anatomy, I'll restructure it so it'll be related to implants. And when you take histology, I'll share with you the histology I've done on implants. And, wow. and as a consequence, I started this implant training my first year of dental school. And then just by chance, there was a guy at our school that would give an hour lecture a year. His name's Paul Mentag. And Paul is one of the original founders of the mm -hmm. AAID. Right. And he would give an hour lecture on implants. and he brought in a guest clinician, and the first time this guy ever did a hands-on surgery at a university was in my dental school, and because I was president of the class, I was the assistant because I knew where the gauze was and all this stuff, <laughs> and his name is Leonard Linko. Wow. So I met Lenny from that experience, and so um, I started doing implants my senior year in dental school. I was done with my requirements. I had applied for a couple patents already by the time I was a senior. And there was a international congress in Monte Carlo. And my dean sent me to Monte Carlo. He, he says, I don't know what to do with you. You've taken everything <laughs> here. You're done with your requirements. There's this implant congress in Monte Carlo. Would you like to go? And it's great. So he pays for my way with, with uh, my wife. And I'm lecturing out there. And in the audience is Ken Judy. And, um, you know, it's just funny how these very early, just by chance experiences yeah. Oh. Casual uh, yeah. introductions. Yeah. Did you know Ken at that time or no? No, I saw him first. Uh, I knew him by the literature, you know, but I had I had never met him before. Wow. Yeah. So you graduate, you go into private practice for a while. Well, I started doing implants immediately because I just always thought it was part of dentistry. You know, I was um, probably too bold and and stupid to realize um, <laughs> that it wasn't part of regular dentistry and because I was magna cum laude and, and had some decent hand skills and dentistry came very easy to me. Um, most anything I saw I thought I was qualified to do. <laughs> even if you hadn't but, done it before? Even if I hadn't done it before because w after all we had lectures on it and so you know <laughs> the lectures for clinical lectures kind of like similar to the lectures of histology or anatomy and so you're expected to know it and I would know it and I had by that point, I had developed this photographic memory so I could just regurgitate just about anything that I've read. And so I, 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 I'm thankful now that I didn't have a patient get a heart infection after an extraction because I probably would have tried to replace the valve because we had <laughs> lectures on valve replacement of hearts. I mean, <laughs> as a dentist, you get lectures like, like, like in everything in medicine, you know? Yeah, why and not I try? Had, I didn't know my limitations at that point. Um, but I knew that I needed more education. And so in order to get that, what I would do is I'd set aside about $60,000 a year, and I would have a patient that, for example, needed a subperiosteal implant. And the guy that was modifying the designs and doing the most research at the time was Bob James. So I would mm -hmm. fly to California. We would do the surgery together. Mm -hmm. I'd fly back with the patient, and so I would see the healing, I'd remove the sutures, and I'd do the prostheses. And then I started doing that with endosteal implants with, with uh, Linkow. And then I started doing with Tatum. I did a hip graft with Tatum. I did you know, other procedures with Tatum. I flew patients to Europe and did things with Hans Groffelman. And, and by the end of five, ten years, the major people in the field, I had been in their office. I had done surgery with them. They knew who I was. I'm providing them patients. Yeah. 
And so quite it, popular, I'm sure, as a result. It opened up a lot of yeah. doors for me. Yeah, I bet. And as a consequence, it was uh, an accelerated, hands-on learning experience, which really we have in developing a specialty. You know, I never realized how important it is, the specialty training that we get in dentistry. As a general dentist, I had this implant-restricted practice. I would do full mouth rehabilitation routinely. And I could never understand why going back to school to do three or four supervised cases makes you a specialist and better if you I'm already doing 100 cases, you know. So you, when you graduated uh, uh, as a general dentist and went into right. private practice, your practice from the beginning was limited to implantology? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you didn't I'm, have the first uh, implant case jitters. So you just dove right into the deep end of the pool. Well, yeah, I didn't know any better, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, uh, stupid confidence, you know. <laughs> I, would, I, I hope I've replaced it with quiet confidence. <laughs> but um, I, I, I just felt that this was the right thing to do. And these removable restorations, I, mean, I didn't have anybody that was happy with them. Yeah. And the more I read the literature, the more I was aware of what was happening. And it just made sense to replace teeth with teeth. And a lot of subs, uh, blades? I did at a, that quite time. a few. The most common patients I had referred to me were lower denture wearers because the profession didn't know what to do with them. Mm. And so if you had, if somebody had a lower denture and was complaining, go see Mish. We don't know what to do with you. <laughs> and the second most common referral I would I don't get, think that's ever changed, right, after <laughs> yeah, all these years? Yeah. Second most common patient that I would see is somebody missing one front tooth because the patient didn't want to cut down two adjacent uh -huh. teeth and loot them together. And so I don't want you touching these other teeth. They're, they're in good shape. They're fine. Go see mesh, you know. And so the two patients I would see most often would be a single tooth implant in the aesthetic zone or a mandibular full arch case. Yeah. So you're in practice for about 10 years, and something happens where you decide, I am going to go back to school, yeah. do a cross program. Well, I was flying out to help Bob James develop a specialty of implant dentistry. And in fact, the first application I wrote myself, um, the EAD wasn't willing to support it back then, so I had the ICOI support it because Kent Judy um, was a closer friend. And so we submitted that first application. We could, there were five steps to get through to be a specialty, and we got through one of the steps. This is a, a recognized specialty with yes. the ADA. Yeah, with the American Dental okay. Association. And so then um, Bob became president of AID, and he picked up the, the banner of the specialty, and so because I was flying out there and helping with this program out there, and he had the first university-based implant program. And so we started using the University of Loma Linda as a base for the specialty in the area. And we got through another step of the specialty when I was with him, and then a guy named Ishmael asked me to um, develop a similar implant program at Pittsburgh. And he was the head of a prosthetic program at Pittsburgh. He says, will you come to Pittsburgh to develop a program like you did with Bob James? And I said, well, I, you know. <laughs> he says, well, I'll tell you what. If you're willing to do that, I'll get you especially in prosthetics. Now, being stupid at that point, I thought he was just going to make, give me hand a specialty, it hand it to me. You know? <laughs> so I go there and I, did, I spend three, four years. I develop this three-year program, and I'm expecting to get my master's in specialty. And he says, no, you've got you to go to school. You've got to be here full time. You've got to do this clinical work. And I said, you lousy bait-and-switch guy. <laughs> I was so mad with him. So I ended up flying out to Pittsburgh every week. I'd stay three days there mm -hmm. and fly home. And then, you know, on the weekend I'd be lecturing someplace. But I ended up taking every course and every clinical thing. And, and um, took three years because I was doing it part-time, three and a half years. Wow. But I eventually got my master's and in, especially in, in prosthetics. Was that awkward being in some of those classes with an instructor looking over your shoulder and maybe was, you know what he's teaching you? It was interesting in that, you know, they would say things like an oral path. This occurs 6% of the time. And I'd say, wait a minute, I've been in private practice for seven years. I haven't seen this once. How can, this, how can you be telling us it's happening 6% of the time? So I was a major pain to them. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm sensing a trend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, I certainly did learn um, the science of dentistry you know, because I had this 
experience before I went back for the specialty that I could take the um, biologic sciences and the clinical sciences and pick out what made sense and what I would see most often and, and developed a role of dentistry based on science rather than dentists basically are trained like my dad was trained as a bricklayer. Yeah. You, you watch and you, you do and you, you don't understand the chemistry of mortar and the differences in setting time by <laughs> but temperature. But you know it works. But you know it works yeah. and you copy it and, and that's basically how we're taught as dentists is, is do this because I told you to do this. You don't know why but all I know is if I do this six times I'm going to get out. I get my check off and I'm going to get out. <laughs> You don't, th and so we, we lose what makes us a doctor. Mm. We're really, you know, we don't like to be called tooth carpenters, but the reality, a carpenter is better trained than we are. You know, they, they have an understanding of why they make a bevel or how they treat wood differently right. if it's a different type of wood. And, and a dentist is just, is, I guess, is that's why it's so easy to fool a dentist, is they're just show me. And, and they think by seeing it or hearing about it that they're able to do it. Mm. And I was there myself. But it'd be like watching somebody play the piano. You can't go home and play the piano. You can see the world's best pianist a yeah. hundred times, but you go home, you can't play the piano. You can't duplicate that effort. A and there's this hands-on requirement with supervised training to allow you to accelerate your understanding and learning curve to it, and that's why I developed the Institute, because it allowed me to have a supervised, hands-on training in this field, which we never had before. And I realized when I went back for my prosthetic specialty that what made me better as a restoring dentist wasn't that I did another 60 cases those three or four years, it's that they were supervised and they were criticized and every step was evaluated mm -hmm. and you're reading the literature every week and you're being questioned on it and you're talking about it and you're thinking about it and you spend three, four years doing nothing but concentrating an effort on one small aspect of dentistry. And at the end, instead of doing 100 cases, which are really one case 100 times and you're doing the same thing over and over, you're, you're getting faster but you're not getting better, oh. especially allows you to understand why you're doing it and indeed you're getting better. And we really do need a specialty of implant dentistry because what I see in the field is just based on what's faster, easier, simpler, it based nothing on longevity or reducing complications or the other aspects of it. And to me, the title doctor means more than being a tooth car carpenter. So you mentioned the Institute, uh, Carl, and it, uh, 1984 seems like about the same time the Pittsburgh experience was ending, or was it the was there a light bulb moment that made you decide ah, I'm going to take on more responsibility, more work, and well, I mean, build this the, institute? The reason why the institute started when it did is that the concept was developed in 1984. You know, prior to that, I was flying to Pittsburgh and developing this specialty program out there, and on occasion flying less often to California, but still continue to help Bob with that program out there, and. I never took a practice management course in my life because I really finances weren't a problem for my practice. You know, there were no other implant dentists. I was a crazy guy from Dearborn, <laughs> and that that people knew where to send a patient if they couldn't handle what was going on. But um, I was the go-to guy if there was a complication at the dental school and they ended up losing their teeth, go see Mish and he'll replay. If they're getting sued, I'd put them back <laughs> at the hole. So, you know, I, be, I became the go-to guy if you were having a problem type of thing. But I never really looked at building a practice or implant practice because I was getting referrals because I didn't have any competition, basically, back then. And I took this practice management course and they gave a homework assignment to these 25, 30 doctors that took this thing. And they said, y'all are different specialties. It was run by a pedodontist. And they all had different specialties that were in this course. They weren't, weren't general dentists primarily. And they said, whatever your interest is or your specialty is, uh, come up with a way to develop something that your field needs. And so because I was traveling around the world carrying patients with me to do this supervised training by the world's 
authorities. The $60,000 a year. The uh, $60,000 a year budget. I said, well, what if instead of me flying there, I have them fly to me and I supervise their surgery and they stay flying with their patient. We do a surgery. Then the patient flies back with them. And so the first institute, there were five sessions, came up with that that same week and you would bring a patient for each session and then we would do the surgery together um, and then I got permission from the state board to have all these doctors with out state licenses come in and mm -hmm. have this supervised training aspect of it and that was never done before in dentistry in any aspect of dentistry there was never any supervised clinical cutting of teeth or surgery or so it was the first hands-on supervised course outside especially and because of the need was so great, um, it was fairly easy to enroll the program. In fact, the other 25 people that were in that class, when I came up with the idea the next day and you know, the report your homework assignment, the instructor said, are you willing to do that? <laughs> You're really willing to, to do this? And I said, yeah. He says, well, how, many, how long would it take you? I said, well, at least five three-day weekends. You know, I know dentists want to be there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. They don't want to come during the week. No. So to this day, it's still five, three-day weekends. Did you know the answer, or you just had to give an answer? I had to give an answer. <laughs> but when you're doing it for a living for several years, you got, you got an idea, yeah. you know. True. And so um, I had no idea what to charge. I'm not an economic guy at all. And so the instructor said, well, charge $15,000. To me, that was a lot of money because continuing education courses were like $100 or something for a weekend, you know. All of a sudden, $15,000. I'm thinking to myself, nobody's going to sign up for this. Everybody in the room said, if you want to do that, I sign up. So the first institute class were the guys that took that practice management course with me. <laughs> sold out. It was no sold marketing. out of me. No, no marketing. Yeah. I had the first. Now, all of a sudden, I had to come up with 15 days of lecture. The longest lecture in implant dentistry back then was an hour. <laughs> there were a handful of guys that had maybe a three-hour lecture, but it was basically some cases that they showed, and they'd always show the same cases over yeah. and over again, the same story, same joke, same. There wasn't any <laughs> education. It was just, here's a couple cases that I've done, yeah. and it's always the best case that they've got pictures of. No complications no, ever. No, no, no continuity of why they did it or or no case series studies of what are your complications or what's your evaluation. Yeah. So all of a sudden I've got to come up with all this lecture material because I have to come up with 15 days of lecture instead of a one hour. And at lecture. this point were you thinking that you personally were going to be responsible for that level of content or did you have a faculty in mind? I I did, well, I, I started inviting some faculty in to help me with the surgeries because all of a sudden we were doing 20 surgeries in a weekend. Right. Well, you need help. I needed help, and we were starting seven o'clock in the morning, and I'd be there till midnight. Right. And so it just when somebody's on an early learning curve during a surgery, they take four, five, six hours sometimes. Yeah. I mean, they, they take forever. Yeah. So um, we had to. I needed some help. So one of the early guys that I brought in was Jack Hahn. Another early guy I brought in was Ken Judy. Right. And um, they would help me with the surgeries, and then of course my residents that I had selected for the full-time residence for the implant program. So one, one resident was Craig, my brother. He was my associate, mm -hmm. and he was doing implants as my associate, and then he enrolled in my program so he could get the university um, specialty in, or certificate in implants, and Randy Resnick. And so they came in and started to supervise. It was good for them because now they're teaching it, so right. they were learning faster. Right. And... Um, most of those people are still with me. You know, I mean, we've been around for since '84, and most of the faculty are still there. Are, are, yeah, so it's it's been an interesting road. Is it still fifteen thousand dollars? It's still the same price: fifteen thousand dollars, fifteen days, five three-day sessions. So you're saying a pedodontist and a homework assignment That's right. led to over ten thousand dentists being trained through the Mitch Institute. That's right. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Now, but that curriculum, as I understand it, is the implant curriculum for five or six dental schools today. Six dental schools use the institute for their oral implant education for their specialty. So what they find is if they're 
teaching perio, especially, that they don't have any faculty to teach implants yeah. because you know, they, they, they're they're yeah. They're good at root planing, scaling, or whatever the, you know they're they're doing, but they don't have any specialty level of knowledge in implants. And so they take a weekend course, and they come back and they regurgitate what they heard that weekend, but they've never done the procedure themselves. In fact. Most of the specialty programs, I don't want to talk too much out of school, but most of the specialty programs, what I've seen is the director of the, the, watching, don't the, worry. the directors of the program have their residents take pictures of their surgery, and they have to give the director the pictures so the director can grade you on your, and then the, they have all the pictures of their resident surgery, and then when they give a lecture, they're using the pictures from their resident surgery, and they've never done the procedure themselves. And so a lot of these authorities have never done the procedure they're lecturing on. Mm -hmm. And so what I they... I think that still exists today. Yeah, well, not as much, I hope. Maybe not in a university setting, but yeah. certainly some implant programs. Yeah, so if, you know, what the hope is, is that the specialty programs that decide to incorporate implants in there, especially, which a lot of them have, Prosthetics just did it this last month. They changed the definition to include implant surgery. Fantastic. Um, perio has done it. Oral surgery has done it. And as a consequence, since they don't have any faculty for it, they, they meet with me and they say, can we send our residents to your program? And it really started with uh, Pittsburgh, but then it went to University of Detroit, and now there's six different dental schools that... I get their perio residents or their oral surgery residents, and they come through the institute, they get university credit for it, and they get their Great. implant training through my institute. And six different dental schools do that now. That's fantastic. Yeah. But what about at the undergraduate level for the, for the general dentist? You, you had some exposure because you had a dean who was passionate about it in yeah. uh, Detroit, but the, the typical dental school today, the typical dental student today, well, it's evolving. It's not as quickly as I would hope, but you know, I give a lecture that has become very popular on the longevity of three and a bridge and its complications compared to a single tooth implant and its complications. And, right. and within that, it's becoming more and more people are becoming aware that you do a better service to the patient if you replace the tooth with an implant rather than cutting down the adjacent teeth and one out of four bridges end up decaying. And it ends up being one of the major causes of loss of teeth, of additional loss of teeth, is, is doing a 300 bridge instead of a single tooth implant. So not only does the, vi the device last longer than the 300 bridge, but the adjacent teeth last longer. And in fact, when you're doing this 300 bridge, it starts a cascade of destruction of the rest of the mouth because the pontic of a bridge acts as a plaque trap, and you can't effectively clean the pontic and less than 8% of our patients floss on a daily basis. In fact, a survey I'm doing right now, less than 8% of the dentists I train floss on a regular basis. <laughs> and as a consequence, one out of four of these bridges eventually decay. And now that that word is out, and I've published it in Dentistry Today and in all my books, and I, you know, I lecture 50 times a year for since 1984. So it's, I'm on the road constantly. And so the word is getting out that an implant is better than a bridge. And as a consequence, a number of dental schools have started replacing the requirement to do a 300 bridge to a 300 bridge or an implant. Oh, okay. And indeed, we've got a couple studies done of which senior dental students doing single tooth implants have high success rates. And as a consequence, they, in fact, at Tufts, it was 100% success for five years. They didn't lose one implant for a five-year period for senior dental students doing this thing. And let's face it, drilling a round hole with a round drill and operating the hole with an implant That's is round. easier than doing endo. In fact, I call it a, a root canal and bone. It, <laughs> every dentist has to do a root canal, and the roots are dilacerated, and accessory canals are coming in there, and you're dealing with infected pulps. With an implant, you've got healthy bone, you're drilling a round hole that's straight, and you're obturating instead of worm gutta percha trying to fill this thing out three-dimensionally, you obturate it by threading in some piece of metal. I mean, if a carpenter can do this, <laughs> one of my best friends is a carpenter. And when I went to Nicaragua to volunteer after the earthquake to help them down there, I brought him with me. And he says, you know, you're, all, you're gone every weekend lecturing around the world. He says, show me some cases of what you do. So I, with great pride, I show him these implant surgeries, and he goes, 
You're just putting a screw in. I do that a thousand times a day. I'm a carpenter, you know. It, it come, it, it, you know, in his eyes, it was the same. And right. there's a lot of similarity to it. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah. He can't charge as much for putting in those screws. <laughs> well, he can, but he, he wouldn't be very busy. Yeah. Uh, in 2007, you published uh, an article that talked about the need for more general dentists to get involved yeah, in, absolutely. in placing implants. And it it's was been my observation that one of the reasons why the implant field wasn't growing as rapid as it should is that if a, unfortunately, the economics of dentistry, you do a 300 bridge, you can schedule your first opening, you get all the money, you deliver the case a couple weeks later, right. you do an implant, you send it off to somebody else, you don't see it for six months, and you're doing one crown instead of th charging for one crown instead of three crowns. And so economically, it doesn't make sense to a general dentist to do the implant crown. Economically, it makes sense for them to do the implant surgery and crown. Because then it makes sense and that does put his time into that effort. Right. And so approaching it one by which is a better service to the patient, that's the way I try to go first. I try to be a moral compass to the profession. What should you do if the world is watching you? Not what can you do, what should you do? Right. And, you know, can you rob a bank for a living? Well, you can, but you shouldn't, <laughs> you know? And, and so within that moral compass, I was trying to get them to come into the implant world because it was better for their patient, but it wasn't enough felt need for them. So then when we got to the, the general dentist doing the surgery, all of a sudden you know, it was much easier for them to start incorporating implants within their practice and doing it routinely. And that's, you think, more because the economics, at least, were equivalent to a, a treatment plan. Unfortunately, I, that's, the economics has something to do with it. It, shouldn't, it should just no. because do what's best. <laughs> you wear the title of doctor, do what's best. It's part of my lecture, but the reality is you want it to grow faster, you're going to make more money doing it, you're going to get more people doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it makes sense. And another thing in that article that uh, struck me as uh, interesting was you talk about the importance of having a great team, which almost seems counterintuitive as the general message is the dentist should do the surgery and the prosthetics. You know, as dentists, we're taught to be competitors with each other. We compete with each other in class for grades. We compete with each other for grades in clinic. We compete for patients within the dental school. We, we're, we're competitors. The dentist that's the, everybody likes is a dentist that comes to the meetings that can't pay the bills, that doesn't have any money, that's crying <laughs> in the corner, he, he, you know. Because at least I'm better than that I'm guy. I'm better than that guy, right. you know. <laughs> so, but we're, we're really um, taught to be competitors. And as a consequence, and we're also taught that there's, there's everything can be done better. I've never seen a perfect crown. I've never seen a perfect, you know. In, in fact, we openly criticize each other because that's the way we're trained. We do this work and the professor comes in and openly criticizes us in front of the patient, in front of everybody else. And, you know, they, they make us in this inferiority complex that we can't do it very well. We're always criticized, and I explain to the residents, you know, have you ever seen a perfect mouth? And the answer is no. There's always something wrong with it, which means we could have a class action suit against God. He's never <laughs> done it right once. You know, well, obviously our definition of what is right may be wrong. Right. So I, I try to put it in perspective of um, this moral compass aspect of education for dentistry at large and implants specifically. And the Institute, because I'm allowed to have these people spend three days with me at a time for five consecutive times, within that year, they've modified the way that they look at a patient. They've not modified the thinking process for what should be done and what's predictable. And, and as a consequence, you can always tell a mission implant trained doctor you know, the, the things that I, I hear constantly is they typically know more than the guy lecturing at the podium. <laughs> and they, they have an awareness, a confidence that what they're doing is the right thing. So um, the team approach, getting back to that aspect of it, is so important to be able to do that. But we're not taught a team approach as dentists. Mm 
Hmm. Physicians work on patients as a team. If I'm a general surgeon, I can't do a surgery on a patient until that patient has gone to the internist and had a medical clearance hmm. of systemic conditions at large right. before I can do surgery. So they're taught to work within colleagues of different specialties, and they're constantly referring back to each other, and they don't criticize each other's work. They understand that they're on this team to help this patient, and within whatever their specialty is, right. they participate in that treatment. And as general dentists, rarely do they send out patients. I mean, general dentists send out less perio than almost anybody else because they do it themselves or the patient doesn't get it. They send out less oral surgery because they take out the tooth themselves or the patient doesn't get the service. And yet the, the best way to treat a patient is a team approach in most any specialty. And the only person on a team that should have no experience is the patient. You don't want the patient with a lot of experience because that means <laughs> they've had a lot of complications. This is probably not the place to start. You definitely refer that patient. But the team in implant dentistry is a pretty broad team. For example, if you're going to do sinus grafts, your team should include a ear, nose, throat person. There's occasionally you're going to have a patient that you need to get a, uh, an evaluation of the sinus before you start manipulating the membrane. Or if you have a complication afterwards, patient needs to be admitted in the hospital, have somebody on your team you already know and you work right. with. And so have somebody to send your complications to. And yet we're not taught that as dentists. We're attempting to do everything ourselves. And the team in implant dentistry includes your assistants, your front desk. So when a patient calls up, ask about an implant, you're, they're not giving this baloney answer. Right. You know, I, I will often, when I return a phone call of a doctor, I'll pretend I'm a patient and I'll say, you know, something like, you know, I'm Mr. Smith, I'm here at the airport. Um, I was supposed to be picked up according to Dr. Monroe, and I've got my $100,000, but and he told me I could have it done today. And it's just to pull their chain, see what they would do. You know, and, oh, wait a minute, I'll go get it to the doctor. You That's know? horrible. And, so, <laughs> but, and I'll ask them questions like, well, what is an implant? And I had one staff member say, well, we take out teeth, and we put them in the refrigerator, and we find a tooth of your size and color, and we put it in your mouth. So no. It really, really. So you have no idea what your staff is saying unless they're on a team and they've been trained. So we started training staffs at the Institute. And, of course, the laboratory is a major member of the team. Glidewell, the thing that you guys have been in education for a long time. I've lectured for Glidewell a couple times in my career. And I've noticed that the lab has an attention to detail, that they have a commitment to the doctors that they work with. And you need to have a laboratory, if you're going to do implant prosthetics, that does these cases all the time. Because any laboratory that gets involved in implant prosthetics, they start to realize this is not the same thing as no. working on teeth. You know, the dentist working on a tooth isn't going to take off more than two millimeters of structure because they're going to run into the pulp. And so you get a preparation that more or less looks like the tooth that's going to be finished plus two millimeters added to the contour. Right. The implant is put it at any angle, and the post is at any angle, and you're in embrasures, and you're too facial, and you've got this inventive prosthetics constantly in the implant world. And if the laboratory isn't experienced, and they're learning on every case, it, it, it becomes a nightmare. It becomes a nightmare for everybody. So um, as a consequence, you need to have specific training for crown contour, for occlusion, for, and that requires a laboratory that financially has invested in implant education. True. Yeah. True.